Hello, everybody, and welcome to the inaugural dev stream for Earthless, uh, the new tactical space odyssey from us here at Blackbird Interactive, the team behind premier space games like Homeworld 3 and Hard Space Shipbreaker. My name is Steven Messner. I am the PR and communications lead here at BBI, and sitting in the captain's chair is our intrepid game director, Hoi Fung Ma. Hey, Hoi Fung, how's it going? Lovely to be here. Yes, I'm, we're very excited today because uh, if you're watching this, you're actually coming to us from the future. And it's a bright future where Steam Next Fest has begun. And as part of that, uh, Earthless is one of the many games that has a, a demo available during Next Fest. So we're so excited you're on the page. Thank you for coming by. Um, for the next little while, Hoi Fung and I are going to be playing through the Earthless uh, Next Fest demo. We're going to be talking about the game and its development. And uh, yeah, that's basically it. You know, before we begin, if you like what you see, it would mean the world to us if you would please wishlist Earthless on Steam. That's the best way that you can show support for the game right now. And if you really want to go the extra mile, which we would, you know, be so grateful for, uh, be sure to follow Earthless on all the social media channels at Earthless Game. Uh, you can join the Discord, which you can find on any of those social media channel pages, or I'm sure there's gonna be little blurbs popping up all around here during the stream. And uh, yeah, I, I think I've, I've said my piece. So Hoi Fung, uh, let's, let's set the stage here. Tell us what is Earthless and what is it about? Yeah, thank you for the intro, Steven. Um... Yeah, Earthless is a deck builder roguelike mixed with tactical elements, but really the core of the essence of, of this game is being the captain, being the, uh, in the captain's chair where you have the burden of command, you have your crew to, to, to manage, and uh, you really have to use your resources wisely. Now, the premise of the game is that you know, humanity found out that we only had a hundred years before the sun would explode. And um, so humanity came together and created all of these ships. Um, so what you're seeing right here on the main menu, that's not Earth. Earth is destroyed. That is your target destination. Um, and each time you play, you play as a different captain going to a different uh, destination. Yeah. Awesome. Um, well, I, 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 that's a beautiful summary. Uh, I, people are going to get a much better idea as we start to play. Why don't we jump right into a gaming and get this thing going? Yeah, let's do it. Let's um, so, embark on our voyage. Mm -hmm. So first off, before you even uh, start the run, uh, you, you have a selection of your faction, and your faction does have um, uh, differences between them. For the demo purposes, you're only going to have access to the first one, the International Aeronautics Association, um, which is kind of the governmental organizations that you know made, made the co um, collaboration of all the people on Earth uh, possible. They're kind of the uh, vanilla starting faction, and once you choose a faction, there are different types of uh, ship classes that you can pick. Each type of ship class does have a ship ability that's unique to its uh, uh, to and to its ship, um, and I'll explain a little bit more about that when we get into game. Sure. So I um, guess the the big question then is which ship class are you going to choose for this run? Uh, yeah, I mean, as you, some some uh, some of you intrepid watchers might have noticed. Um, um, we are big fans of retro sci-fi books. Um, a big inspiration for this game um, is the plot lines and and kind of uh, um, from like taken from those uh, old retro books. So uh, these are all from some of our favorite authors. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, I think it's very evident yeah. even just in the UI, right? Like the big chunky buttons, <laughs> glowing different colors, yeah. CRT of, screens. Uh, yeah, yeah, with CRT screen, a lot of Ron Cobb inspired yes. artwork. That's kind of our North Star, if you will. <laughs> I um, love it. But, yeah. Uh, so for this time, you know, Asimov, I have it has a special place in my heart as sure. as an author. So I'll pick that. Um, I'll skip tutorial. You all can just play the tutorial we, yourself. Will be the tutorial. Hmm? Huh? Oh, I said will be the tutorial. Yeah, yeah, will be the tutorial. Yeah. Just all right. Walk through. So what's this screen here that we're seeing? This is uh, all the ships that are leaving the solar system, right? Fleeing after the sun has destroyed Earth. Mm hmm exactly that. As you can see, a lot of those signals were actually lost. So um, just trying to hint towards that this is a roguelike. It's not meant to be easy. 
Uh, you are meant to be playing this over and over again. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of things going on here, but one thing I really want to point out because I think it's such a core part of Earthless's identity is like the user interface, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, Hui Fang, but uh, I think one of the, the North Stars, the pillars of Earthless was like this immersive design, this idea that you're a captain. Um, and so there was this amazing opportunity to make the game feel like you're sitting at a command console. So, you know, this isn't like, you know, a lot of games games kind of break the, not the fourth wall, but they, you know, the UI really doesn't feel, the word is diegetic, right? Um, mm -hmm. But here we, I know the team has just been working uh, ceaselessly, ceaselessly to make the game experience feel like, you know, almost first person in a way where mm -hmm. you're, you're sitting, you're seeing through the eyes of your captain as he's sitting at his command console, staring at this mm -hmm. hollow table um, that yeah. will change. You'll see as we move between the different uh, sort of game modes. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like one of our pillars is really wanting to make the players feel like Cap, not just with like the cards and the gameplay, but also from the artistic expression. And there's more to come. Uh, um, this is, uh, we are going to hit early access in 2024. Um, um, so there definitely is uh, more iterations to be uh, to yes. come. But as, as, uh, as Steven has mentioned, Diegetic is kind of the name of the game for us here. Um, you can see that everything you, uh, on this console is are, are interactable, big buttons and, and 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 monitors that the captain will look at. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, everything on the a uh, grid is a projection from uh, the hollow table, and as you can see from the transitions. Um, we really lean into that holographic look, um, um, a little bit of a uh, oh, kind of yeah. Star Wars and Star, uh, Star Trek um, um, technology. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, here's our first look into gameplay. Uh, um, as as you can see, it is a combination of you know the classic deck builder roguelike genre, but uh, kind of combined with like a um, tactical gameplay. Now. Yet yeah, when we say tactical gameplay, I know a lot of people think XCOM um, or squad-based uh, gameplay. Um, this is actually more akin to uh, something along the lines of a RPG, a tabletop RPG, where you only control the single ship. So you're not controlling a fleet uh, 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 and you don't have multiple characters to control. You only control your own ship and your uh, and your cards are representing the the, the things that you can do um, with uh, with your ship um, right. in that respective turn. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is sort of like whenever you start a new run, this is uh, at least in the in the demo version, this is sort of like the tutorial mission that you go through. Um, mm -hmm. What you're going to see here is uh, Hoi Fang is looking at some destructible objects. There's some asteroids creating some debris on the field, uh, which we're mm -hmm. going to have to clear. One of the interesting things about Earthless is the combat encounters. Um, because it's taking place on this tactical grid, Hoi Fang, feel free to just keep playing and I'll talk over it. Um, so but one of the cool things with Earthless is, uh, you know, compared to other deck builders, for example, like Slay the Spire, um, those games you end a combat encounter by killing all of the enemies. Um, but here we have a lot of different, there's a whole new dimension of strategy available here because, uh, for example, in this combat encounter, you do see there is one tiny little enemy in your way, but theoretically you could avoid him and run towards the exit, uh, which are those two tiles at the very back that are glowing there. Um, and so there's quite a few combat encounters where uh, killing all the enemies is not necessarily um, required, um, though there might be reasons you want to do that. Um, but here, uh, in a lot of encounters, it, it's more about escaping as quickly as possible, uh, especially if you're low on damage or uh, low on, you know, hull points. Um, so Hoi Fung is playing cards here. These command cards essentially uh, are the functions of your ship. Um, so he's moving forward. There's a lot to unpack here, so we're going to do it, you know, yeah. slowly, I, I, piece I, by piece. Yeah, I can talk a little bit about the mechanics and then I'll just go straight through it. Um, one thing that is, uh, I think, a unique feature for us um, uh, is the heat mechanic. Uh, your engines only have, uh, every time you move, um, you do increase your heat meter. And once it reaches the max, um, you cannot no longer move. Um, this is kind of our solution to the classic problem where you're, you're you know if if you can only if you can move so much every single turn um then it kind of negates the uh advantage that certain cards might give which is like longer range right, right. so 
every turn you only depreciate your heat by one so there's a little bit more of a thinking ahead uh, kind of chess like uh tactician like uh a mentality that you have to ad adapt uh, adapt to um what i love about it and i'll probably interject a lot of fun facts uh as, as we go Please here because we're all we're all space nerds and uh, on the team is that um, um for those who think that uh heat is not an issue because in the vacuum of space it's super cold that is not the case heat is actually a huge issue because uh in the vacuum of space there's no medium to carry out heat um, yeah, there's, no venting. Is, uh, there's no venting so you have to use certain gases or heated up materials like metals and then eject it out of the eject it out of the ship before you can actually yes. cool things down so uh a little yeah. bit of a fun fact. I, I love that you brought that up because I, I did not think about that in the context of Earthless, but you're absolutely right. Like, you know, astronauts, if they go out into space without a spacesuit, it's not that they freeze to death or suffocate to death right away. The thing I think will kill you first, or I've heard will kill you first, is the heat radiation from the sun, you know, depending on where you are in space. But, mm -hmm. like, if you're in orbit above Earth, that's the number one, uh, the, the real killer <laughs> if you were to be ejected out into space without the proper safety equipment. So you just totally torched that enemy. Uh, but I think this encounter definitely, is, it's sort of a soft encounter for people that are jumping into the first run. Uh, we'll definitely mm -hmm. unpack the enemies in, in the next time we have a combat encounter. So yeah, you, yeah, yeah. There's plenty to come. Um, uh, this is more of just the tutorial for the movement. I'm gonna go through this um, pretty uh, pretty quickly so that we can get into the more juicy bits um, yeah. and, um, faster. But as you can see, after you completed an encounter, um, you will get a reward pack. And the reward, um, sometimes you'll have multiple reward packs, but um, every encounter will reward you with a new card to add into your deck. And this is kind of the core essence of a deck builder, right? Like, yeah. this is why it's called a deck builder. Um, every time you play the game, it always will give you a different randomized choice and 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 depending on your luck as well as your skill um um your play style will have to adapt very differently each one um so right here i can see that there's gemini missile launch which is an attack card um the range is great for a range um, um and the damage is equivalent to uh a uh, uh, normal missile launch but the the range is increased by two um, it has an additional effect where it creates a, another Gemini missile in your deck for that turn, which is why it has a keyword called deplete. Um, <laughs> once once it once you end end a encounter, that card will go away from your deck, so you're never going to flood it completely. Um, so it's a very very strong card, but it also is a the downside is it thins out your deck as you go. Right. Emergency vent. Uh, as, uh, as 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 mentioned before, uh, you only depreciate one heat per turn, but if you use, there are cards that help you vent your heat so that you can move a lot more. And that is a viable strategy to have a movement-based uh, deck, uh, uh, movements-based strategy. Yeah. Um, there are other, other, other uh, mechanics that kind of relate to heat. Um, it also has a key word called retain, so it does not go away from your hand each turn un uh, unless, unless you cast it so it's quite quite strong and then the last one is an equipment card it's actually quite fortuitous that we have all three types of cards uh in the first, first <laughs> yeah um, um, we but, did not uh, script this i promise no no not scripted at all you can test it for yourself but uh, um the the yellow cards are equipment cards and when you cast them you get this passive bonus for four turns and then for that encounter it will go away so missile launch cards will deal three extra damage to additional uh, adjacent units when a target is destroyed so a very good kind of making your making your missile launch cards uh, uh aoe if you will right um, so here's the question which card are you going to pick this is the 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 first mm -hmm. card of your deck yeah, I, I, I'm partial to equipment. Uh, yeah. I do like my I do like my passives. So Very I'm powerful gonna... when they start stacking up. Indeed, indeed. Um, all right. So, so we completed that encounter. Now we have a choice of two more combat encounters or a salvage site. Um, yes. I, I don't know about you. My vote's kind of especially because that's <laughs> that salvage site leads into oh, a fine. lot of combat encounters. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe we'll. Wh which way are you thinking of going? Um, I'm so so. This is another aspect of planning that is pretty critical. Yeah. Um, you do want to look ahead because uh, if you just pick what is best in front of you, you might lead yourself into a point of no return where uh, you are not setting yourself up for success. Right. Yeah. Um, 
star map, and the demo will only have one star map, uh, um, will end at the boss, the boss encounter. But uh, in the uh, early access build, um, to finish a run, you're going to have to beat three star maps before you reach the planet. Um, yes. So this is kind of a more truncated experience that you'll get. Yeah. Um, another aspect um, that uh, we don't talk too much about in this build, um, but we will definitely emphasize is you see these kind of windows into different areas of space. Yeah. Um, these represent zones and different zones will have different effects. Right now in the demo, we only have planetary and asteroid, so they're pretty simplistic. Um, but in the future, um, we will have nebulas that will obscure the, 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 the nodes on that path or um, solar flares, which have a lot to do with the heat mechanic um, or ice zones, which can uh, also help you along with the heat mechanic where you depreciate heat faster, but uh, you, know, you might get stunned and there might be more ambushing. Yeah. Kind of, um, so adding like all of these different layers and modifiers to combat. So it's, you know, when you're fighting exactly. enemies, maybe you fought a combat encounter like that before, but when you start taking in all the modifiers that can be stacked on top of it, it could feel like a very different combat experience. So here we are back onto the combat grid. Uh, Hoi Fung is up against three Lusk units. So Lusks are the basic uh, enemy faction that is available in the demo. Uh, we are going to have more enemy factions. Um, I think at early access launch, we're going to start with just the Lusk, uh, Lusk, Lusk faction, sorry, uh, of which there is, you know, several different unit types. And then as the game uh, continues through early access, we're going to be adding more and more factions, which will have, you know, their own unique mechanics and play style that you have to fight with. So um, these Lusk units, Hoi Fung, let's talk about, uh, I think, one important thing to establish right away is um, how you gain information on the battlefield. So already <laughs> you've destroyed one guy, but you have these two other grunts remaining and uh, your turn is, you got a little bit of energy left. So, uh, why don't you play off this turn and then we'll talk about uh, how players can understand and read the tactical grid to understand what's going to happen next. Yeah, so one thing that um, uh, differs, again, from um, uh, kind of the, ta the, the, the traditional tactic genre is that we do not have percentile chance of being hit. Everything in uh, uh, the, the battlefield is um, deterministic. Yeah. So yeah. the the onboard computer is powerful enough that it can kind of predict the future by one turn, uh, and it can predict the future when you and, and it is um, reactive to what your actions are. So it's unlike uh, 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 certain games where once it is projected, that is what their move is. They do not change their move. It like let's say like a unit will say they move there um, to get closer to you, and you move away. Um, um, instead of just saying, oh, I'll still move to that tile, they will react to uh, your new location. Yes. But, yeah, so so, the, so how you get that information is either you can mouse over uh, the unit itself and you can see that um, let's uh, this unit right now in my current position yeah. will move down two squares and then attack me for four. But um, a better way to do it is just holding tab. Um, holding tab will just show you everything every unit on the battlefield and what they're they're going to do so for instance right now even though i have five shield and 40 health um, um i will be taking quite a beating with uh two two of the units dealing four dam uh, uh, four damage to me so eight damage in total um now one really cool uh feature that we have is um when you're moving you can still hold tab and it will project what you that what they'll react the to outcome, when you, yeah. yeah the outcome of that movement so this is pretty critical for any pro players out there that really want all the information um, um, um all the tactical information to make the best kind of the best decisions yeah um, um so right now i do want to get close so i can kind of deal some damage um but i also want to not take any hull damage <laughs> so i'm gonna move up one and then shield up which should theoretically mean that i have enough shield to Block all the damage. Yeah. Um, yeah. What are the shields? Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Shield. Um, one really important fact about that is that it does not carry over turn by turn unless you have um, special kind of uh, status effects. Yeah. So even though I have nine shield, I can't just go into the corner and just turtle up. Um, 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 this is only good for one turn. Yeah. All I was going to say is with these less grunts, like a quick tip for you players at home. 
Um, one thing I really like about them is, you know, sometimes you're looking in that moment where you're like, damn, I'm about to take eight damage. Uh, maybe I don't have a shield card on me. This looks like a really bad situation. Um, you can use that predictive model to uh, understand how the lust grunts are going to react to your behavior. And one of the things that you can often do, I find, is uh, hit them for damage. So if you go on the offensive with a lust grunt, sometimes their AI will, uh, when they've received damage, they ha sometimes have an ability where they will try and raise their shields. So mm -hmm. this can be really useful when you're in a situation where you're about to take some damage uh, and it feels like you, the instinct is to want to turtle up and try and mitigate that damage somehow. Um, but in a lot of situations, especially when you're just facing these last runs, uh, it, it makes more sense to go on the offensive uh, because you can then change their intended, their, their next move from attacking you into uh, them essentially turtling up. So one thing I want to call it right here is you are about to exit the map, but you see uh, also the square up in the top corner there has yet turned red. So in, a, in some of these combat encounters, especially the ones where you can leave early, uh, another really special thing here is that more enemies can spawn in. Um, so, you know, there's lots of, when I said the grid really adds a whole new dimension of strategy, I meant it because uh, imagine you had decided to play very defensively and stick to your side of the grid. Uh, you could be potentially, well, <laughs> with the way the chips fell in this fight, you would have actually had two Lusk Grunts spawn right on top of you, um, and you would have been very far away from the exit. So there's kind of a lot of decisions you have to be making. You know, Hui Fang, you talked earlier about uh, this game wanting to, one of the pillars of this game is making you feel like a captain, making you feel like you're making hard decisions. And I think we've, one thing I'm really proud about with this game and what the, the team has done so far is making that uh, feel present and even just minute to minute combat decisions where, you know, not moving on the grid in a way that is proactive uh, can really put you in prickly situations. Mm-hmm, agreed. Um, yeah, like uh, that's, like the additional aspect of the grid really allows us to play with more more objectives than just destroy everybody on the other side. Yeah. Right. Like there's escape missions, there's escort missions, there's you know um, fog of war missions. There's there's a lot of ways we can um, utilize yeah. grid. Last for X grid. amount of turns. Like there's exactly. a lot of options, which I think that's a, uh, something that I, I think can be that I love about Earthless. Right. Is um, you know, being a roguelike deck builder, it's a very crowded space. There's a lot of amazing games in that genre. Um, mm -hmm. But I feel like Earthless is carving out a very unique spot for itself, um, especially, you know, in combat encounters and all of the different um, ways that they can play out and all of the different, uh, I guess, diversity uh, of those encounters. Um, mm -hmm. All right. So finally, we get a new Lusk unit. What's this guy? Yeah, so this is the Lusk Overseer. As you can see, kind of runs away. Um, that's because <laughs> it's a support unit. Um, you can inspect the units by either right-clicking on it to see like, exact kind of details as to what they can do. Here, you can see that it will buff units, uh, allies, and then uh, debuff enemies. So, I uh, mean, in, in a pinch, it can actually deal some damage, but uh, it would never prefer to do that un unless there are no more enemy, uh, unless they don't have any allies to buff. Another yeah. quick way to do that is you can click tab, and um, all that information will be also shown on the on the right side. As that well. tab key, man, you got to be pressing it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> pro, pro tips. Uh, pro tip. Pro tip. Yeah. All right. So you just used your equipment card. Remind oh, me what yeah. that one was. Oh, it made your missile launches do three extra damage for a few turns. When it when it, when it destroys a target. When, when it, it destroys, destroys a target. target. That's the key. Uh, which includes uh, asteroids. So as you can see, even though that my uh, missile launch cannot reach this unit. Um, if I destroy the uh, this asteroid, it will still deal three damage to the right. to, to the unit, um, next to it. Which in but, this case is very fortuitous for you, right? Because otherwise, you can see here your range for that missile launch would not have reached uh, would not that have lust reached. unit. So you you can be very clever with how you use your abilities in Earthless. Um, so exactly. yeah, exactly. But I'm actually not going to do that. I'm going to captain's orders there. Uh, and then uh, destroy this Okay, so Captain's Orders is an interesting card because it uses the combo mechanic. Now, deck builders, uh, veterans are going to be really familiar with combo mechanics. Basically, if you play a card before playing a card with the combo keyword, you can trigger additional effects on the combo card. Uh, what did the Captain's Order one do? Yeah, so if you can take a look here, it on its own, it's already a really strong card for two energy. Uh, it uh, deals five damage and gains five shield, which is 
a little bit over the 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 the, the base rate. But if you have combo, which is like if it's not the first card you cast this turn, you additionally draw a card and gain one energy. So it's just a very good value card. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, alrighty, so I don't oh, like yeah. that Overseer. Uh, so <laughs> I'm going to use Battlefield Analysis to give me more options, and that one draws two cards, and I discard one. Um, but I don't like getting hit either, so I'm just going to use Target Locked, which marks it. Uh, so now it has... Uh, when it dies, it'll give me energy, uh, and it'll take more damage equal to the stack uh, of Vulnerable. Yep. Uh, so with that, I should be able to use Mjolnir Strike and then uh, destroy it with yeah, Missile Launch, yeah, which yeah. also deals three damage next to the, to the surrounding. Yeah. yeah exactly. Now, those asteroids, we were talking about asteroids, you know, they're on the field. They're not just there as something to shoot at that gets in your way. Um, another important thing about asteroids is that they actually can act as line of sight barriers. So some attacks um, will use line of sight. And so having an asteroid between you and an enemy can actually be very useful in certain situations. And then um, if you've noticed, Hui Fang has destroyed two asteroids on the field so far, and they've left behind this sort of like ethereal glowing thing. And that's some asteroid, what's it called? Debris cover. I was going to call mm -hmm. it asteroid dust. <laughs> and uh, yeah, debris cover, which then creates sort of a, a, a battlefield effect that, um, can enemies also utilize that? Or is it just yes, the player? Indeed, nice. indeed, actually a great example. So this grunt is in the debris cover, uh, as you can see. And so even though Captain's Orders does five damage, if if I cast it, it only takes four. So it's something to be aware of that the tactical elements of the board, it's neutral. Uh, everybody can use it. Yeah. Um, and so uh, uh, um, sometimes you want to position yourself so that uh, you're in the most fortuitous position compared yeah. to your head. So you're going to so take off this Lusk uh, Overseer. Mm -hmm. And now we just got the Grunt left, which should be relatively oh. easy pickings for you. Indeed, but... That uh, that free cover is actually uh, uh, d doing a lot for it because it's uh, take taking a lot of a. Uh, it's smart AI too because you know he could have left that, uh, but instead he opted to stick to the debris cover. He knows when he has a, a good position. Yes. So, so he, and, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, um, for those who with keen eyes might have noticed that there was a bar on the side that said, um, so zero to a hundred. Every time you took, if uh, you take damage or you deal damage uh, directly to an enemy, you get a little bit of a charge. And now that it's full, uh, the Asmov class of class ability, um, ship ability is now active. Um, these, this carries over across runs, so don't use it frivolously because if you uh, uh, you can yeah. keep it for moments where you really need it, right? Um, yeah. Which is definitely not where I am right now. <laughs> yeah, I think you are in a strong position. This is what I was talking about earlier too, with uh, these mission scenarios where you have to exit the map in order for the combat encounter to end. Um, I think that you know it, it's probably not a situation that players are going to encounter often, but there's definitely even a world where I could see players oh, exploiting yeah. their uh, their ship's uh, ultimate ability by staying in a combat encounter. Um, especially one where they feel very confident in and basically farming the enemies that are going to be continually spawning in in order to uh, you know, farm up extra ultimate uh, ultimate ability progress. <laughs> I'm trying to think of how you would describe that, but yeah. All right, so you got another couple of rewards here. Uh, yeah, um, so one thing that I haven't mentioned, and I'm going to start talking about this uh, right after uh, we get into um, the, the star map, is that on the bottom, you might be able to see that there are roles assigned to cards. Yeah. Um, whenever you pick a card, that person will be a little happier, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit um, what, what that. Yeah. Means. Oh. What person could you be talking about, Hoi Fang? I, I'm so curious. Yeah. Oh, and you also got a uh, an artifact. Also, yes. Um. So sometimes uh, it's dependent on the luck and chance of the level yeah. and the difficulty of the level. Um, um, artifacts are. Uh, um, basically upgrades that you can attach onto cards to change their uh, text um, and their abilities. So you can, over time, customize your cards and make them uh, a little bit stronger, especially since the difficulty of the levels will increase. So I'm actually going to talk about two screens right now. Yeah, go for the it. First one, yeah, the first one is the manufacturing module. Um, this is um, all the cards on this ship are physical cards that the captain's using 
kind of like floppy disks because we're going for retro sci-fi <laughs> um, and you're inserting them and those commands go onto your ship and then all the other members of your team uh, of your ship um, um, kind of like execute on your commands. Now, uh, here, here you have three, uh, basically you have three um, tabs. The first one is crafting. We'll talk about crafting when we get to a salvage site. But upgrading, so I have two artifacts right now. This one makes a skill card give shield. Uh, and then this one gives an attack card plus one range. So I'm actually, and, and and since I already have these artifacts, it's free to install on a single card. So let me, yeah, which card I would want to add that effect to. Now, I tend to like adding it onto cards that tend not to have a lot of base value in itself. So battlefield analysis, it's zero cost. So um, by adding the artifact onto this card, it's a zero cost. Gain five shield, draw two cards, discard one. So yeah. very, very effective. Just by using that one artifact, you've automatically made um, that card. Sorry, what was that card's name again? Uh, Battlefield Analysis. Battlefield yeah. Analysis is already better than your shields up, like your basic shield mm -hmm. card. So yes. you can see how artifacts uh, over time can really start to be like a major force multiplier, um, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. why like, you know, new players, especially if you're just playing this demo, um, don't let your artifacts sit in your inventory unused. Certainly, you know, there's a bit of a balance there where you might want to save an artifact for a card that can really use it, but it's it's kind of like, you know, RPGs where you beat the final boss and then your inventory has like thousands of health potions in it because you didn't want to use them because, you know. Yeah. Uh, so definitely use your artifacts as they come because uh, it'll mm -hmm. it, it's key to keeping up with sort of the difficulty curve uh, across campaigns, across voyages. Exactly. Well said. Um, yeah, and, and um, another thing about artifacts, right now in this demo, you can only attach one to each card, but uh, in the early access build, um, the number of slots for your artifacts will be determined by uh, the rarity of the card. Um, and 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 we'll, we'll we'll expand on that in early access. But um, right now in the demo, you're never going to get that far. But uh, in the future, you could have up to three artifacts on one card. So you're really <laughs> making something that's special, yeah. and unique. That run unique to you. Um, um, something that we we really want to emphasize, some, uh, like uh, games like FTL, where you have stories that you remember even after playing it for like yes. a couple years. Uh, it's like, oh man, that time, you know, I had a missile launch and it was crap, and then I upgraded the heck out of it, and then it became the best card in my deck. Right? So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, the, the the one card that won the game. Exactly. So. Carried me. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, adding more more customization in your run so that each run is a unique experience. Yeah. I'm going to add uh, this artifact to add one range to my Mjolnir Strike. Uh, Mjolnir Strike only has two, and the difference between two range and three range is actually pretty massive because it's yeah. a square. Um, so I'm going to just add that. Yeah, that's right. Now, like when you think about it, two range is four squares. Uh, uh, three range is, what, would that be nine? Yeah, so two range is actually three by three. Oh, three because, by three. Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, and then the uh, uh, three range would be a five by five square. So, yeah. so the difference is um, exponential multiple. almost. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, all right. So, recycling. Um, so, a lot of you who are familiar with kind of deck builder games, um, you you won't go into the trappings of uh, the usual uh, uh, new player, where it's, which is. The more good cards I have, the better my deck. Well, the more cards you have in your deck, the less likely you're going to pick the cards that you want, right? Yeah. So, even though shields up and you know missile launch, those st start off fine as you know gain four shield and deal three damage. Over time, they're not really going to be that useful when the enemy's health goes up, and you really want a higher chance of pulling the cards that you want, right? Um, the, the powerful cards that you drafted. So. Um, here, I, uh, every three nodes that you travel, um, you, you can tell by the little green light on the bottom, um, um, you can remove one card from your deck. Um, yes, and so, do uh, this. This is another like hot pro, pro strat. Pro <laughs> recycle. Tip, pro tip. Every time you can recycle, you should recycle. Exactly. So uh, unless, unless your t deck is already refined yes. in the late one, but like in the early game, you know, sh unless you have a lot of synergies with it, remove the shields up, remove the missile launches. You'll you'll have a higher chance of pulling the cards that really matter. Yeah. So because, because I just added a uh, 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 
artifact on my battlefield analysis card, which already gives me shield, um, I can remove a shield card um, um, pretty happily. So I am going to remove that card and then uh, head back in. And you can tell how many turns you have, how many nodes you have to travel before yeah. uh, getting the card um, on the bottom right there. Um, all right, so our first exposure to the non-combat encounter cards. Let's take a look at the point of interest. Uh, and this is a great time to introduce the crew. Yes. Um, so a lot of what we've been talking about is mechanics and, and elements like that, <laughs> um, which is, of course, the bread and butter of your gameplay experience. Yes, but the deck building want... nitty gritty. Exactly. Uh, um, but, you know, you're not a captain without a crew, right? Uh, without a crew, you're just a pilot. And so every time you launch a new game, um, you will have a different crew members. And these crew members are uh, pulled from a vast pool uh, and they all have their own little personality quirks. Um, and so you can see this is kind of like a Discord channel, essentially, where yes. the gunnery officer is saying to us, like, hey, we collected these Lost Pearls. Um, we should use them for research on weaponry. Whereas then the science officer is like, well, no, 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 no. We don't. Ha we need the opportunities to kind of investigate its anatomy so that we can advance our medical technology. And you, as the captain, has to kind of make a decision. Now, this is the first. This is only the first story. Stories change. So depending on what your choices are before, they do affect um, the stories in the future. So um, you can either choose to research for combat capacity or, or medical advancements. Um, and as you can see on the side, different members of the team have very different kind of opinions that will yes. affect their morale. You can also um, see too, both options net you a, a card. A it card looks like, as right? well, yeah. exactly. So a lot of uh, short-term gain, short-term uh, rewards, as well as the thinking of like long-term um, long um, consequences as well. So yes, this will net you a card. This will make three people happy. You might think that, that hey, that's a no brainer. This one makes three people happy. <laughs> And only one person sad. Um, um, why not choose this one over that one, which makes two people unhappy and two people sad? Sorry. Um, well, depending on the choice, there could be consequences, um, more devastating consequences in the future. Um, yes. But for now, I will choose combat encounter. Um, and, and so I got a serrated rounds, a gunnery officer card. I'm added to my deck. Yes. Why don't we pop open the crew menu? I, I you know, I, I know we're spending a lot of time explaining stuff, but I, I, I'm hoping, you know, people watching at home. By the way, you should totally wish list Earthless on Steam. Um, Help are us appreciating, a lot. you know, I, I, one thing I love about Earthless is just this depth, right? It, it, it doesn't feel like so. It's not that the game is very daunting to get into, because uh, you, you start to pick up the stuff over time. You can play right away, and yes, you might not make the most optimal run because you didn't make use of every system available to you. Like you forgot to recycle cards or craft cards or whatever. But over time, you're going to start to get better and better in your mastery of all these different systems is going up. But I, I do want to take a second to talk about this because this is probably one of my favorite things about Earthless is, um, and I think something that just makes it such a unique and special game is this, this, this crew system. So yeah, here we have the different officers. They each represent the different functions of your ship. Um, and as Hoi Fung pointed out earlier, they also align with the different uh, rolls on the card. So you have gunnery cards, those cards deal damage, and then you have your gunnery officer who sort of uh, oversees the function of those cards. Now, uh, the most important thing here is the crew morale, um, or not the most important, but one of the more important things here is the crew morale. So as you make these decisions, and it's not just on those nodes, I think um, eventually the game will have you know more opportunities for your crew's opinions to go up and change. Um, mm -hmm. That, that's tracked in this morale uh, this morale meter. And so as it goes up, your crew might unlock positive bonuses. So when that's what you have to be so careful about when you're making decisions is, you know, I have this gunnery officer, my build is very emphasis, like emphasizes gunnery cards. Uh, do I want to piss off my gunnery officer? Probably not, because he could severely impact the the efficiency, the functionality of those cards. And so it's a game of managing these different players, but at the same time, you know, you piss off your chief engineer, suddenly your shields aren't working as good. That's a really scary situation to be in uh, when you're taking a lot of damage. So it's, it's managing these different personalities. All of the crew have also their own 
personality quirks that you can look at that sort of govern their responses. So you might have an optimist and a, a pessimist or, a, you know, sort of mm-hmm. the, the bleeding heart scientist or the, um, I don't know, but there's hundreds of these. There's, there's a lot of characters, yeah. a lot of characters, each with their kind of, and, and it, it while it is semi-dynamic in the sense that uh, um, you don't know which crew member you're going to get and their traits will affect how they react to certain events. Um, um, uh, yeah, like they are, uh, the, the character that you see on the portrait will be that character. Um, 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 They're um, an uh, archetype. Uh, an archetype of a yes yeah. exactly an archetype of that character um so kind of leading um kind of segueing into into crew um another aspect of crew not just about the morale is that you can pick up upgrades for them and these upgrades are uh, permanent buffs crew passives that you carry throughout the run um and this is uh, uh as a, a very very strong kind of uh, passive abilities that you'll just get throughout your run that will affect kind of how you build yeah. um, your, your deck. So as I can see here, there's science officer, you know, gain gain two energy every four turns, damage control systems from the chief engineer. Every time you lose hull gate, repair one hull. Um, first strike at the start of the encounter, gain three overcharge, overcharge, increases the damage um, for the first attack that you deal. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then when you exhaust or manually discard a card, gain four shield. That's actually quite strong with uh, uh, Battlefield Analysis, because then that would actually gain me nine shield instead of just five. Right. And then uh, get, us, uh, get us out of here. At the start of your turn, if you're adjacent to an en- enemy, you lose one extra heat. I'm going to go for a shield build right now. And, and once I click it, you can tell that right there, crew morale uh, will go up. Yeah. So. Uh, they um, like being upgraded. Exactly. Um, it, you might notice that, like that, even though that I clicked it, the, their morale has not immediately changed. It is a meter, um, so uh, it does take several different uh, elements before yeah. a. Once character. you cross a threshold, that's you when you're, threshold. you'll see the, a benefit kick in. Mm-hmm, um, exactly. Okay, so this map has quite a bit of. Uh, those are radiation zones, right? Uh, those are contaminated Con- tiles. Sorry, contaminated tiles. But, Thank you. But, yeah, uh, before we go ahead too far, um, one interesting thing is uh, the mutator system. We've kind of mentioned this before, but yeah. uh, We're going in. Uh, uh, to to modify the experience, even though you can see the repeated levels um, um, over and over again, there are modifiers that change how that level can behave. So in this very case, um, um, enemies have durable hulls, so their hull max hull has been increased by four. Yes. And so that it's even even though you're going to be playing these handcrafted levels over and over again, um, the what you see is actually can can your your experience can differ quite dramatically depending on your combination of uh, mutators. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so let's get through this combat encounter. You know, you play. I'll do my best to kind of keep up and narrate. So you played both of your equipment cards there, so stacking up some passive buffs that will hopefully help you survive this, because this actually seems like a fairly daunting encounter to have early on with all the contaminated tiles and then enemies with essentially, in some cases, uh, 200% (laughs) more hull. Uh, All right, so if I go here, um, I actually will survive most things. Enemy nails down. Four damage there and kill it off. Um, so one thing is that this is a new unit. This is the Impaler. Yes. Uh, um, they react a little bit differently than a Grunt, which can move and attack at the same time. Um, they're kind of like a bishop in chess, or actually a queen in chess, where you can see that it lays down the track for where it's going to shoot, and th- uh, and so you can move out of the way to kind of avoid it. That That's yes. kind of what the uh, red tiles mean. Yeah, so it, it's, it gets really interesting once you have sort of uh, combat encounters like right here, you know, you're dealing with some impalers and some grunts, uh, but once you throw like an overlord in there and a few of the other less units we have, uh, which, you know, we'll see if they show up in some of these later combat encounters, uh, it gets pretty hairy certain times and you really feel like you're staying on your, you got to stay on your toes in order to avoid damage, not just using shield cards to outright mitigate damage or going on the offensive and destroying it before they destroy you, but then also uh, using that heat very smartly 
uh, especially in a case like this, you can see how heat management is like top priority because you have the contaminated tiles, which you'll take damage if you're on at the end of your turn. Um, but then you're also having to dodge the impaler shots and then worry about grunts also taking the hot shots at you at the same time. But, uh, you know, Hoi Fung, true to your uh, genius <laughs> card brain, I'm envious wow. of it. Uh, <laughs> I, I looked at this and I was sweating a bit. You seem like you're handling this no problem. I mean, this is this is a game that you are the game director of, so I would maybe be a bit worried if you were really bad at it. But oh, well. yeah, like um, again, something that I really think is um, I am very proud of the team um, is that um, it might look daunting, but I do think that only, controlling only one ship. Um, makes things very intuitive. Just yeah. Um, uh, uh, and, and anybody who has any sort of experience with traditional area. games like chess or or, or, or checkers, um, um, I think th that experience actually does carry over uh, quite well. Um, that kind of spatial awareness. Um, yeah. So right now, uh, yeah, and and something about heat venting is, um, you know, something to note is sometimes if you don't need to move don't move because you'll actually carry that one vent forward, one heat forward, so that next turn you can move two tiles. And and that could be a very valuable resource um, um, that you might not have access to if you just yeah. try and move every once every turn without without um, thinking forward ahead of time. It's, it's funny, you know, you were talking about um, feeling overwhelmed uh, in the controlling just the one ship because uh, you, we were talking about this weeks ago, but uh, how an earlier version of Earthless at one point uh, we, the team had experimented with this idea of um, not just controlling one ship, but having your cards, uh, essentially, when you cast a card, you could place more ships on the map and it became a game more kind of akin to an XCOM or a Fire Emblem or something like that, where you're moving multiple units around the map. Um, and I remember what you told me it was so fascinating was, you know, when they were pro when the team was prototyping that iteration of the combat system what you found was that you know deck builder fans really gravitated towards the deck building component so casting the cards but really started to ignore the unit component of <laughs> moving all their different units around their little army that they were building whereas people that came from maybe more of an RTS background uh, did the exact opposite uh, where they were really yeah. focusing on moving and manipulating their units on the grid but then were almost neglecting the cards and weren't playing it and so it felt like you know uh, sort of cramming two different games together and trying to make them work and that's where you eventually kind of came to the conclusion that you know what it's better if we just have the single ship which you know fits the, the theme and the story of the game you're a lone captain and crew uh, out in the dark reaches of space. Uh, but you're right, I think it makes it a lot more cohesive of, uh, of an experience uh, when you're just having to worry about moving your one ship and shooting from your one ship. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, you can see here that there's still no shortage of, of complexity at play here. So what's happening in this map, uh, th I love this map. Uh, essentially, every turn, uh, squares on the map, starting sort of the back of the map where you spawn in, uh, contaminated so you're essentially having to move forward through this asteroid field uh, which you know could be blocking your path you're fighting enemies at the same time and in every turn uh, the map is you know slowly uh, getting contaminated so it's pushing you forward it reminds me of like those old Super Mario levels where the camera moves and you gotta move with the camera um, yeah and then we do have a new yes Lusk unit has finally showed up uh, this one I, I can talk a little bit about yeah. this um, so yeah, like uh, um, so this is the Lusk Hive. It's the first two by two unit. Yeah, uh, you've uh, that, and I think it's the only two by two unit in the demo. We have more, um, but every every couple of turns, it will spawn new units. Yeah. So you know, another thing about you know the objective of the game is that it's not always to kill everything. Um, 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 a lot of times, it's actually to try, try to survive, right? And so uh, 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 these Lusk Hives make it so that there's a little bit more of a soft timer, not just the contaminated tiles, which you know, poisons you and deals damage over time. You also have kind of a hive so in the in the front so that the longer you linger behind, yes. uh, the more units will appear in the back. <laughs> yeah. This is, I think, definitely a map where you, you know, fight when you have to fight or you know when you have the spare energy uh and cards but probably best to just be moving towards the exit and and moving yeah. on so, uh, so here here's an interesting decision sorry for kind of yeah no, no 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 um um 
right now, I can cast Mjolnir Strike, and it will deal massive amounts of damage to the, the Hive. Uh, in fact, I probably have enough energy to kill the Hive. But it gains one heat, and you can tell that my heat is already maxed. So what does that do? Well, it adds a critical error card, something you haven't seen yet, um, on the top of my deck called Overheat. So I'm just going to do it for demonstration purposes. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, but yeah, I'm going to destroy that. Uh, and because it's on the top of my deck, the next turn I'll draw it. Oh, where did it go? Oh because I shuffled the deck because the, the discard pile has been emptied. So you got lucky shuffled. there. Yeah. I got lucky there. So it there. actually wasn't that interesting of a choice because if you <laughs> were the type of person to really be paying attention to what was happening, yeah, you're right. You would have known that overheat would have ended up straight into your... Uh, right into your hand. Yeah, not right? right into your hand, but would have been shuffled back into the draw pile. Shuffled it should have in ended up in your hand. Um, exactly. And yeah, this is essentially a burner card, right? Like it, it basically takes up a spot in your hand uh, where exactly. a more valuable card could have been. Exactly. And it also takes, you take one hull damage, so it goes through your shield um, every time you play a card. So you have to, you should probably cast this as your first card, um, which means not only does it take a slot in your in your hand, That's you right. only drew four cards instead of one. You also need to spend one energy, so you're, you're, you're it is a yeah. draw, it's a pretty hefty drawback. Um, Silver lining might be like, oh, I, I have a combo card, and so, you know, I get to still use my combo card or something, but yeah, it's definitely, you want to be careful with those overheats. Exactly. So um, that's why having a card draw is so valuable because um, uh, a, lo a lot of times you do want to kind of cycle through uh, your deck so that you can kind of have, uh, yeah. uh, you know, different different ways to access the tools that you want in that moment. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm should I do it again, add another overheat. Uh, probably not because I do need vent. Because if I don't have vent, I'm probably not going to make it to the end um, right. as, as enough. Um, which again, very thematic. Um, something that we try to incorporate into our cards. Um, yeah. Um, where of course your ship overheating uh, will cause you to die. So oh damn, I should have cast cast it overheat before. I was too zealous with the zero cost <laughs> card. So you took the damage. Uh, so I did take the damage. I did take one damage unnecessarily. Yeah. Uh, so I'll, I'll cast the overheat. Um, but because I have vented, I can move up to three tiles in the front, which is excellent. You'll take out the asteroid, and then you're basically ready to escape. Exactly. And because of the mutator volatile asteroids, um, one shot basically destroyed them all. Right. Um, which is excellent. Um, all right. Yeah. So perfect, another vent heat, and I got out of the way just, uh, oop, just in time. We're going in. Right there. Yeah, um, that was definitely a prickly encounter too. Um, yeah, one thing, you know, like th this build that you're solely building towards now, um, I don't know, would you describe like a core strategy that this build has right now? It seems like you just have a couple of strong cards that you're relying on again and again. And yeah. again. Like you have your, yeah. your, you have your artifact upgraded captain's orders, um, I, or battlefield yeah. analysis, sorry. And then your, your Mjolnir strike is obviously a really powerful card for you here. But wh what I wanted to talk about was like how good it feels when a build starts to organically come together. And what I think of is actually when we had PC Gamer up uh, back in the summer, uh, PC Gamer wrote an article. They uh, did the first sort of gameplay preview of Earthless. Um, and uh, uh, Wes, the journalist, was playing. And it was his first time playing the game. And he stumbled into this shield build that absolutely like destroyed everything that he was getting through. And it was so fun to see because you think, well, a shield build, wouldn't that just make me very tanky? But Wes had... Uh, Fung, you might remember some of the cards that were key here, but Wes had essentially stumbled into a couple of cards that not only got him lots of shield, but then there was a card that essentially allowed him to vent his shield and deal that the, the that amount, amount of, of damage. Yeah, that yeah. amount of damage. The same amount of damage as he had shield points. So you could stack up this enormous amount of shield, run straight into a group of enemies, play this card and deal, you know, 20 damage to all adjacent enemies and it, it was like really really fun to watch and i think like you know it, that's the key thing with uh these types of games right like roguelikes especially 
um, is that feeling of uh, it's okay to break the game. In fact, we want you to break the game because it's temporary. You're gonna, even if you you know break the game and you get all the way to the end and you beat the boss, what a rush that is, but you're gonna start over again and it's gonna be completely different, you know, rolls of luck, rolls of the dice. Uh, and so you might never stumble into that same OP strategy uh, a second time. And so you're always gonna be chasing that dragon, so to speak, of, of uh, mm -hmm. feeling like, you know, getting the, the right cards, the right artifacts to just absolutely stop anything in your path. Exactly. So right now, what I, I kind of have is a uh, a little bit of a shield build. Um, I don't have all the pieces, um, yeah. not like rested, um, but uh, you can tell that uh, even, even with my, uh, uh, just from my crew passive of gaining shield every time I discard a card and um, um, because of my uh, happy uh, Palms officer. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, I am actually getting quite a bit, uh, quite a bit of shield each turn, and I do have a, a Hoplon battery card, which every time I gain shield, deal three damage to adjacent units. So this is sort of like the baby not, version of what I was describing with Wes. Version, exactly, <laughs> baby version. Um, not as good, but yeah, still good enough uh, that I am uh, not taking, uh, not taking that much damage. No, not at really all. And you're actively dealing damage. So now, like, your build is really, I think, uh, it's so important to kind of play the hand you're dealt in Earthless. And so, you know, because you have this Hoplon battery uh, equipment card active, it kind of incentivizes you to play a very, like, upfront bruiser type play style. So, you know, if you're the type of player that really likes to sit back and, and snipe things from a distance, uh, you're going to have to change that play style in order to survive this voyage because you don't really have a lot of cards that are gonna play well with that kind of uh, strategy. Instead, what you need to be doing is what Hoi Fung's doing right now, which is getting up in enemy spaces and using your shields to actively deal damage to any surrounding enemies and then your gunnery cards to uh, uh, strike, you know, do to fill in the gaps, essentially. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, unfortunately that Hoplum battery has now, ex uh, has, has now uh, yeah. Yeah, expired yeah. itself, so. Or expired, uh, yeah. Uh, it yeah, doesn't exhaust, do right? Like when, when they don't exhaust after equipment resolves. So once you cast the equipment, uh, it is no longer in your oh, deck for right. the rest of the encounter. So it, it exhausts are... when you're casting it, not when it, yes. not when the passive wears off. Exactly. So uh, there is a little bit of a drawback to them, but there are ways around it. So you can make a, a full equipment build, um, which allows you to, um, um, which allows you to kind of like get them back from. Uh, uh, from the exhaust pile, if you will. Yeah. Um, but there, there you go. All if you're done. if you're watching this, you know, I, definitely Earthless, I think, is a game. You you love roguelike deck builders. A lot of the team loves roguelike deck builders. Um, if you're not a big fan of this genre, that's totally okay. Like, you know, the tool tips and everything like that are really going to help you understand the different keywords and abilities. But I just wanted to point out, like, exhaust. If you're hearing this word exhaust, you're like, what the hell does that mean? Uh, it just means that the card is removed from from play. It, when you play that card, it is no longer, it doesn't go into your discard pile where it will eventually cycle back into your draw pile. Um, instead, mm -hmm. it is just sort of gone from that combat scenario. But as Hui Fang mentioned, there are always ways, uh, whenever there's a rule, there's a, another rule. There's always a way to break it. <laughs> there's exactly. always a way to break it, which is, uh, I think, as someone that's played a lot of roguelikes, uh, that's always a good sign. So, um, so this is kind of first experience of crafting. I went yeah. to a salvage site. I picked up a schematic. Schematics are one-time use, uh, kind of craftable cards, equipments, uh, uh, cards or artifacts. Um, so this card is quite strong. It's quite strong because um, it creates tactical strike, which is basically a nuke that has a very large AOE and does a lot of damage. So the warhead arming sequence kind of like delays your your new you're, you're basically yeah. turning the keys you're turning the keys in the ship um so that's <laughs> the next turn yeah you get your new. i i and, love this card just because of the visual effect of when it's cast so oh, i'm gonna yeah. i'm gonna say it's mandatory when this card shows up in play that you use it so we're at the boss encounter this is we it. are so this is essentially the end of the Next Fest demo ends with this boss encounter. But like Hui Fong mentioned, uh, in early access, you're going to have three. When, when Earthless first launches as an early access next year, you're going to have three of these star maps to get through. And that sort of represents uh, Act 1 of the overarching story, which we haven't really talked about much today. Maybe we'll mention a bit in a bit. 
Um, but that's sort of Act 1. And then as Earthless sort of moves through Early Access towards the full launch, uh, we're going to continually add more of those acts, which will add uh, more star charts. And so eventually, you know, a run of Earthless uh, will be uh, a bit longer than what Take you were experiencing position. right now. Um, and uh, yeah, a lot, uh, a lot a more enemy factions, a lot more variety, a lot more bosses, more, more, more. So, you know, hopefully you're looking at this right now and you go, wow, this really looks cool. Uh, it's only going to get more cool as time goes on, which is my reminder uh, to you, those of you watching this, please, please, please. Uh, it would mean so much to us if you would just take a second and wishlist Earthless on Steam. Just go click that wishlist button. Uh, it's the best way that you can help us at this point in its development before launch. Um, and, you know, it would just mean so much to us. Uh, of course, you can also follow us on social channels. Uh, I think we're on all the major platforms at Earthless Game. Um, and then on those platforms, you can also find a Discord where you can hang out with other captains and swap stories and strategies uh, and interact with the community. We have a lot of cool things planned for the future. So uh, you definitely want to be in those spaces. Um, yes, so I've talked a lot. <laughs> I feel bad because it was poorly timed with the introduction of the Spawn Herald. Uh, talk me through this boss, Waifun. Yeah, so um, as, as you can see, there are multiple turrets on this gigantic lusk, um, and the core only um, reveals itself when one of the turrets are uh, down. Now, they're not down forever. Um, they have a timer before it repairs itself, and then uh, so the core can close again. So in this encounter, you really have to make sure that you're managing not just the damage on the core, but also the timers on the, uh, the, the turrets themselves. Yes. If you are close to them, the turrets will just shoot you directly, but if you're far from them, they'll start spawning these uh, little little suckers, um, these uh, Lusk Seekers, which are uh, basically uh, suicide units that contaminate when they hit you. Um, so if you're not careful about your placement, um, these little bad boys will just start hit, uh, you know, ramming into you and contaminating the battlefield, and uh, the more you get contaminated, the more damage, passive damage t uh, you'll take. Um, which means that, uh, uh, yeah, uh, it'll just be that much more difficult to kind of like uh, deal damage to the core. So it's a little bit of a race against time. Yes. Um, you have the so tactical right strike, and I have mandated that you use it. You don't have to use it right now, but I want I, you to use I, it this time. I will use it right now. I mean, why would you not use it? It's a zero cost it's, uh, card. But here, here's a little lesson in sequencing, right? So yeah. right now I have uh, every time I gain shield, you know, okay, so that's fine. Um, deal damage, it's two more, and another barrier matrix. Every t uh, Three times I gain a shield, gain over shield. So that means some of my shields can actually carry over to the next turn. Right. Um, doesn't exactly help me immensely right now, but um, Barrage actually gets me to have an attack card played twice. Um, now, I don't have max uh, 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 heat right now, so I'll use Barrage first, and then Tactical Strike will hit twice, so you can see that's a gigantic chunk of damage right there already from 60 to 44. Yeah, so, and two, two, two nukes moves. get to go off one and after the other. Oh, oh yeah. I love that. There you go. Um, and so uh, uh, that uh, now I still have a, even though right now I have a full heat, a full, uh, heat yeah. um, and I'm still in line of uh, damage right now, and as you can see, that's pretty hefty damage. I still have the emergency heat vent in the back um, back pocket, so I can go to a much more advantageous spot, like right here, which means that I won't lose any uh, any. Yeah, and if you uh, remember earlier, we were talking about destroying the asteroids and creating the debris oh, field. So now you're, you know, sitting in a debris field. That's a really nice place to be, uh, where you will mitigate some incoming damage. Exactly. So uh, missile launch, destroy that little thing, uh, warhead arming sequence, and then to battlefield analysis, which gets me the tactical strike that I wanted. Um, and then I, with because it's zero, uh, I can use target lock on the core, which gives it vulnerable. Use Mjolnir strike on it uh, so that it also gets more vulnerable. Uh, and oh, it hit phase two, so then I can use my tactical strike on uh, the turrets. Strike. Right. On the yeah, turrets. so you did, you did so much damage to it that it transitioned to a new phase. The core closed before you could do a direct shot at it. Um, yes, so in the second phase, the turrets actually have a little bit of a different behavior. Um, and instead of just shooting straight 
Um, it will shoot artillery uh, kind of uh, uh, salvos at you. So more of the battlefield, uh, no matter where you are, they, these are global kind of like uh, uh, artilleries. Um, um, it makes it just the, your placement uh, just a little bit more uh, important. Yeah. So, uh, all right, so I'll use that. I'll use uh, another mule near a strike. Uh, gain some shield. Um, do a missile on. Yeah. I'll go up one. Missile launch. Moving. Go back. Launch. <laughs> be okay. I love that. Mm -hmm. So right now, if I use target lock on the boss, it has uh, extra vulnerable. Use battlefield analysis. See what little goodies I get. I don't need shield because I already have 13. Um, I'm going to use Captain's Orders because it draws me another card. Yeah. And drawing me another card always helps. I think uh, you can... Oh, Ooh. one damage. All right, all right. So. I mean, you, you clearly have this one in the bag. <laughs> Not bad. Not bad. So I'll just move right over here. And I have two, another vent heat. Oh, you could have. Oh, never mind, never mind. Sorry, I thought that was a shield card. So I was... give you damage. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, so vent heat. So why I use that one instead of this one is this one has retained, so it will stay in my hand. So next turn, I'll still have it. Um, but. I'm pretty oh, sure, yeah. unless I'm monumentally unlucky. <laughs> yeah, that would have to be really bad for you to take yeah. 35 uh, points of damage in one turn. Yeah, although these these uh, artillery do do a lot of damage, so you can tell that like even just taking one oh, salvo, yeah, yeah. 22. So there, are, yes, it may seem that oh wow, like I haven't taken a single shot, like uh, uh, I must be able to tank a lot. Uh, uh, that is not, might not necessarily be true. There have been many moments where I thought I got this in the bag and then uh, ended up in a very bad position where right. uh, I, I died. But Yeah, and these types of it, boss encounters, right? Because in, in the early access version where you're going to go onto another star map after this, your, mm -hmm. your hull would reset right into the new star map. Or would you keep your hull points all through one run? Uh, you will recover. You will recover after, uh, after a boss. Yeah. yeah, we we might tune that value. It might not be full, um, but for now, yeah, we'll, we'll just go with a full, so that after you beat a boss, you know, you don't have to be too economical with kind of saving your health. Um, That's exactly it. Like bosses are the spot where you can go all out, but early, in earlier encounters, like because there are a Lusk enemy that essentially does the same uh, artillery attack as mm -hmm. those cannons were doing. Um, yeah. You're going to want to be really careful uh, about, you know, the type of attrition that you allow yourself to take on because, uh, yeah, the la there's nothing worse than getting to the end or getting to a boss encounter and just knowing that you do not have the stuff to survive. So we did it. <laughs> you 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 beat the, the run. I'm not surprised because you uh, are the game director. Uh, not necessarily. It yes. is a little bit of a random, like, yeah. yes, you know, skill does matter quite a bit and, uh, and you know, depending on what your your cards you get the artifacts you get you have to adapt to all the situations and of course knowledge contributes to that but uh this game is hard um this demo of course is a little bit tuned to be a good yes. uh, kind of demo experience but like the core game is going to be uh, 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 something that you can come back over and over again and always find something new to Yeah, if you're, kind of... uh, exactly. If you're a veteran to this genre uh, and you play the, the next fest demo and you're like, man, I really breezed through that. That's great. Feel proud of that. Um, but also understand that that is not necessarily the intended difficulty sequence that you're oh, going to experience, yeah, especially when you're dealing with stacked star map or like, you know, several star maps over the runs because, of, you know, this is essentially star map one of many. Um, yeah. So it's naturally going to be a, a softer landing than the, the other ones. So let's take a second and, and talk through this screen because I think it's important to let people know, you know, what they right. can expect once we launch in 2024. Yeah, speak, speaking of uh, kind of early access content, there are so many things we're so excited about to, 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 to show you. Um, for one, we kind of a little talk, talk briefly about story. Um, um, in this one, it's quite light, just like ship stories, but um, we will have some sort of uh, kind of campaign, not campaign in the traditional sense, but the every run you take, the your, the universe is going to be more explored. And the more you explore the yeah. universe, the more of the mysteries as to you know, who are these Lusks? Where did they come from? Why did the sun explode a hundred years 
uh, in a hundred years rather than billions of years. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of mysteries that will be teased at uh, early access launch, and we'll be releasing more of that throughout early access. Uh, uh, yeah, too. it's a story that's going to evolve. And so if you jump in on day one of early access, you're going to get sort of this the first act, the campaign act one. Um, and it's going to, yeah, exactly. It's going to be some breadcrumbs. And then as the game continues to develop over the course of early access, those uh, acts are going to continually release and you're going to get a really satisfying story. Um, I'm so excited for what we have in store. Obviously not going to spoil it, but like if you are a fan of, of classic science fiction, you know, we were talking at the very beginning when you were picking your ship class and it's the Asimovs and the Clarks and the Burns. If you're somebody that's read those classic sci-fis, like I think this is a game uh, tailor made for you because we've taken so much inspiration from those stories, um, not just sort of in a visual sense, um, but in a, in a thematic and a narrative narrative sense mm -hmm. as well. Uh, and then in addition to that, you know, we're talking about n this is just an early access launch and these numbers are going to go up, but we're talking about 90 plus cards, 20 plus enemy units, 50 plus crew members. So we're talking about how crew members kind of their their uh, archetypes, their yeah. archetypes, and you kind of have a random assembly of those archetypes on each mission. Mm -hmm. uh, and then a, a big one is co-op. So co-op, mm -hmm. everything you just saw, you can do that with a friend. You're taking your turns simultaneously, um, which mm -hmm. we are really excited about uh, what a, it might not sound that important, but I, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll speak a little bit about it. that. Um, yeah, so in traditional kind of co-op, uh, co-op tactic gameplay, it's more of a turn, like, I take my turn, you take your turn. Something that we're very excited to um, um, kind of bring to the table is simultaneous turns. Um, this was partially, partially just inspired by uh, kind of 4X games kind of did this already. Right. Where Civ, unless you take like hot, hot, uh, what hot is it? Seat. Like hot seat, yeah. hot seat mode. Um, my turn happens simultaneous to your turn, right? And and so this is kind of how our co-op play will work. You control one ship, I control one ship. We can cast our cards however way we want. We can wait for you to cast all your cards and then I cast mine, or we can interlace them so that it's like, okay, you do the target lock on that, so then I can use my tactical nuke, and then you do, you know, blah, blah, blah. So so there, there's a lot more space for us to kind of uh, uh, expand in terms of Kind of like the design space where yeah. um, you, you know you can you can have much more coordinated um kind of effects yeah, yeah and what's so, so great about it like i remember when we were talking about this um well, i don't know whenever ago uh you were talking about like the tabletop so like you know it's interesting if you're jumping into this and you haven't heard anything about earthless in the past one of the earliest prototypes of earthless was actually done in tabletop simulator hoi fung mm. built it himself and you ran it like a dungeons and dragons campaign yeah. um and so when people were playing it it really had that table top RPG vibe and that's what the simultaneous turns allows for because there's going to be lots of table talk where you're like should I do this and then this and then this instead of just sitting and waiting for one person to do their thing and then it's your turn to do your thing you're working together it's true co-op um, and the other thing I wanted to shout out real quickly is that yes if you're wondering well won't that make the game really really easy uh, no because everything will scale for the co-op mm -hmm. so you can expect a, a challenge as significant as the single player game will be in co-op mode so um, exactly. that's it yeah so exactly all right well, I'll, I'll say it one more time we said it multiple times but <laughs> you can't say it enough wish list. please wish list it really does help us out um, um, uh, I you know like uh, it definitely is something that uh, uh, would would be you know um, really help us out in terms of uh, uh, getting our our na name out there and getting more visibility, yeah. so that we get more update updates out there. So. Yeah, totally. And you know, here's the thing, like. Uh... Blackbird Interactive, we work on a lot of games. Some of those games are big games, right? Like Homeworld 3, Minecraft Legends and stuff like that. But uh, Hoi Fung and his team are actually coming out of a program called uh, Skunk Works that we run every year, where we essentially allow people to pitch their dream game. And uh, if that game, uh, you know, if the, if the leadership team likes that game, they will uh, buy the rights to it from that person and then give them the, the staffing and resources and the uh, the ability to pursue that project, prototype it, um, and, and hopefully Hopefully it'll, like Earthless has, turn into an actual game that is shipping one day, which is very, very surreal, I'm sure, for you, Hoi Fang. So what's the point of, of all of that is that, you know, this is 
<laughs> Earthless is in in every sense of the word very much like an indie endeavor, it, and it's so endeavor, things like yeah. wishlisting, you know, mean so much to us. Um, so you know, thank you for for watching all of this. Hoi Feng, do you want to do? You, uh, how are you looking for time? Do you think we have time to like try and cram one more run in? Uh, yeah, I mean, we can we can we can give it a go. We can give let's it give a it a go. go, and then you know, if we got to end it, we got to end it because uh, yeah, you know, we, we we have real lives here. We don't live in. <laughs> I, I don't exist inside of this pale room. Um, yeah, we'll do one more. So you, you chose the uh, the Clark class ship. So what was the special ability on that ship? Yeah, so the Clark class ship um, gain uh, allows you to uh, add five dire missiles, which cost zero, but they uh, have four range. So um, just by having five of them in your in your hand um that's already uh, 30, uh 15 damage straight up and that's not even including all the combos that you can uh kind of uh, derive from that so yeah yeah um, all right so we're in so we're gonna go through the same combat encounter that we did at the beginning um obviously asteroids are different spots and stuff but um kind of this soft it. movement tutorial uh but you'll notice that the star map that hoi Fung, uh is is navigating right now is actually entirely different so we're gonna have some different events some different encounters um we'll see how things change and then you know especially different artifacts different cards uh could lead to a very mm -hmm. different experience yeah um, so another already thing to yeah, yeah, another thing to kind of notice is that um, uh, different classes have different, slightly different starting decks. Um, so in, in this case, I have Cluster Missile Launch, um, which was that really cool kind of AOE ability that, um, and that, that uh, was just cast. So uh, do experiment uh, a little bit with different, um, uh, different classes because uh, uh, they're kind of tuned to start in a different position. Right. In this, in this case, uh, um, it is tuned to be a little bit more uh, offensive in, in terms of um, having missile strategies. Yeah. Um, yeah and so. I, I'm noticing, like, especially with your dagger missile special ability, and then um, um, that sorry cluster. Uh, I can't remember the name. Launch, cluster, cluster missile launch thank you uh both of those cards have four range as you were saying so uh a, a bit little more, bit more uh, yeah it, further range further Last range wow yeah um did you end yeah, up siding with the gunnery officer again there did you um I, 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 I did i actually i did so you picked um, up the straighted uh, rounds like yeah, I do like my attack cards. And okay. as you can see, um, the, the portraits have changed. Um, they yeah. are different characters. Um, different characters have different quirks. You might not notice that in this particular demo. Um, we built this demo um, to be more of a tuned, fine-tuned experience. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, uh, in, in, in early access, each one will have their different kind of responses. And, and that's some, something that we're very eager to expand on. Yeah, I think the crew system is something that, like, especially, you know, compared to what you see today uh, towards early access launch, and then especially as we get into early access development, um, I think that's definitely a system that, um, I don't, I, you know, I don't want to make a guarantee and say it's going to be, you know, completely different or anything like that, but I think it's a system with a lot of opportunity for growth. Uh, another mm -hmm. thing I think that's kind of hard to get a sense of in the demo with the crew is because you're just playing over the course of one star map. Um, I think crew interactions and seeing the morale bonuses uh, shift either towards positive benefits or negative ben or uh, it wouldn't be a benefit if it's negative. Positive buffs and, and negative debuffs, uh, those are things that I think take a bit of time um, to start to really apply up. So, you know, you can kind of, I think, imagine for yourself what it would look like doing a three map run uh, in Act 1 when the game is available in early access and how uh, your crew can really start to slide from one end of the morale scale to the other um, and how those effects can really start to have a, a major uh, impact on, on your run and your strategy. Mm -hmm. All so right, so yeah, you mostly this is another uh, simple encounter. It looks like you're probably just going to head for the hills. I am. So something something uh, um, that that's, you know, you have to be aware, of course, different different strategies require mm -hmm. different kind of uh, adaptations. Um, this particular deck does not have a lot of card draw, uh, which uh, makes it a little bit more difficult to kind of get to uh, get to that um, vent heat, vent uh, vent heat that that I want. Um, so I have to have a lot more cards that kind of 
don't pay off now, but pay off in the future. So yeah, yeah. battle preparations in particular, right? Discard two cards, but and lose, and the next turn you lose three heat. So it's a little bit more of a, a forward planning kind of um, um, glass cannon uh, uh, sniper build. Yeah, I was gonna say yeah. like you're, you have to be really intentional with how you're moving around the map, but on the pro side of the, of the build the or like on the plus side, yeah, you got great range and you got great offensive capabilities. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is kind of the second story, right? Because we've developed our technology for weaponry, we found that our en we can use it for energy, um, for, for engine upgrades. Um, so we can get engine upgrades or we can get weapon upgrades again. Um, now I'm, I'm doing this, I'm doing this uh, uh, on purpose because uh, some of the stories aren't as factual as that. And I don't know if I'll get to one, maybe I can, but uh, um, sometimes uh, 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 crew members can get pretty angry that you're only favoring one side. Yes. So we, we can get to that. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Oh no, I, I was just gonna say, so here, yeah, you've made it. So you're uh, picking up a crew upgrade option so you can just choose which one. Um, yeah, just to reiterate that point about this, the, the narrative events, the points of interest chaining. Um, you know, in a lot of deck builders, I think there's sort of this idea of like the narrative node or whatever, where you're given a little bit of a story blurb. And I, I love that we've kind of taken that idea and gone a step further with it, where the choices you make in one uh, will affect the outcomes that can become available in the other. And you start to get these little stories. And we were talking at the end of the last run about how there's this big overarching story um, that is going to be told, you know, as the game continues through early access, we're going to add more acts to that story. Um, and it's, uh, you know, a, a, a classic space opera-esque type tale. Um, but then there's also the, there's kind of different levels of story uh, that you're going to experience when you're playing Earthless because then there's also sort of individual personal stories of your run and the decisions you're making and how your crew feels about those decisions. And then at the same time, there's also these little story vignettes that kind of paint a bit of a, a picture about what life is like aboard your ship. Um, so, you know, your crew is obviously going to weigh in and have opinions on the choices you're making in those stories, but those stories, as you kind of work through them and they chain together, um, will paint a really interesting picture. So there's almost like three different levels of storytelling happening here, which, uh, you know, I love, because I love good stories in video games, and I love roguelikes, and roguelikes are really good at telling sort of that procedural generated story, your own personal story of like, oh man, that one time I got that card and it was so powerful, or I was so close to taking down that boss, and I, you know, the luck of the draw, and I, I ended up dying. Um, but then on top of that, I think it's great that we're telling uh, sort of an actual traditional authored story as well. And, uh, you know, it's, it's something I think we're, is a strength here at BBI, especially if you've played any of our other games or, you know, even the Homeworld games is our lineage. Um, it's something that we're really leaning on, especially you know, the card space shipbreaker and stuff like that. We pride ourselves in telling a good story. And uh, just because this is a roguelike doesn't mean we can't have our narrative cake and eat it too. Mm -hmm. So this is an interesting yeah. combat encounter because we've seen, you know, we saw the Seekers in the boss mission, but then there was also the um, the artillery Lusk as well, which I think you already took out. Um, yes, but... the artillery is down, but um, I am too used to being that up-close bruiser that I have been taking a little bit more damage. Yes, I was going to say, <laughs> you are uh, honestly a little bit scarily low <laughs> in hull points this early oh. on in the run. Uh, I'll see how you come back from it. I'll be fine. Uh, <laughs> Famous last words, potentially. Potentially, potentially indeed. Okay, so I'll use Barrage, which then should be able to... I mean, I can take a big... I can take a little bit of a risk. So knowing that if I go here, they will go to these two tiles, right? If I go here. Mm -hmm. um, I Cluster Missile... Those is, tiles, yeah. Uh, well, it's it's random within those nine tiles. Yes. So I can click here and hope that... Oh, there you perfect. go. Uh, those tiles get hit. So when I end my turn, they go to those tiles, and then my cluster missile launch will preemptively uh, hit them and win the encounter. So there you go. something, again, and, and uh, thinking ahead with the tab is absolutely critical. Yeah, absolutely critical. Um, so I do have a lot more heat venting in this um, in this run, um, which is good because then I can kind of zip around the map. Um, but I do not have enough card draw, so um, that's why I took the equipment where every time I gain shield, I draw a card, a very strong effect. 
All right, so all units gain two overcharge, <laughs> um, which means their first hit is gonna is gonna real hurt real bad. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try and make sure that I uh, don't uh, don't take too much of an initial. Yeah. Fortunately, you know, you're starting uh, with the spawners, so you're not going to have any upfront damage, at least this turn. Um, but I think it definitely emphasizes the need to take down at least one of them as quickly as possible before the field starts getting flooded. So now two more units have uh, entered the field. Luckily, one of them is an overseer, so we don't have to worry about too much damage from him, but then you do have... Um, yes. This is a perfect time to use my ultimate, which allows me to get... Yes. Uh, Great more, point. We're clear of the contaminated zone. Cards out, and I should have enough to at least take him down. Uh, yeah, with the missile launches. So I can do that. And Target destroyed. And then I can shield, which draws my card. Um, yeah. I'm gonna discard these. Perfect. So at least one. I have stemmed the bleeding a little bit. Um, <laughs> there's a nice big hit. So, just good. Enemy shields are down. Shields activated. I should be fine with 25 until there. Uh, bef the the node before uh, the node before um, the boss is always a. Uh, salvage site so that yeah. you can up a little bit um, yeah i don't think we really explain that too much so the salvage site you have the opportunity to choose whether or not you want to uh go for oh, salvage that eliminated. might get you a new card or uh if you want to Taking instead position. use that site to repair your full damage so right before a boss yeah it might make sense unless you have managed like last run i think you're in such a helpful position you would just go for the uh the yeah, salvaging yes, the car. Sorry, I went for the car. Yes. Yeah, but I think in this one, it definitely would probably make sense to just top up before going into the boss battle. Um, mm -hmm. So let me see if I can. Especially because last run you had so much shield, uh, like you were just constantly dripping <laughs> with huge Deep. amounts of shield. Moving out. Here it feels like you're in a little bit more of a precarious situation where uh, a lot of damage all at once might do you in. in I mean, we were talking about those artillery strikes doing like something like 20 damage. Like that could yep. effectively be the end of you during the boss battle. Yeah, so so something that I do need to be very careful of in this particular run is uh, making sure that my positioning is stronger, but I do have more tools to, to do that um, in yeah. that I do have a lot more uh, cards that deal with deal with uh, movement now because i've upgraded my uh, my, my pilot enough that it already gives me a lot of the uh venting capabilities i can re uh, i can remove one of my vent heat out of my deck so that i can uh, uh, uh draw my more offensive cards more yeah. often yeah. so i'm gonna go uh, to yeah, so here we are, um, where Captain seems like a lot of priority <laughs> is given to improving the weapons. We're not a military organization; we're a colony ship. I feel like other departments benefit from less tech, right? So because I've been choosing, yeah, yeah, we, I just want my gunnery officer to be like super good. Everybody's kind of unhappy, and, and, and so gunnery officer of course they like hey we gotta prioritize weapons above anything else like if you can't kill us they'll kill us we're dead then there's no colonization at all so we can continue to prioritize gunnery but everybody, everybody just like that it's like the meme <laughs> yeah whereas uh um exploring others um does uh does uh um increase everybody else's but uh does uh, uh does uh, affect kind of like the gunnery officers yeah um, gunnery officers kind of thing. so this is where you get into some really interesting decision making especially when it comes to your crew and sort of the passive bonuses of your ship because um i think you know naturally you're gonna want to gravitate towards um you know if you kind of just try to keep everyone in the middle ground you're not really reaping the benefits of your crew um, so you naturally want to kind of play favorites with the crew members that best reinforce your, the strategy that you're going for. But then you have to ask yourself, is it worth it if I end up pissing off the other crew members who might end up being like a really bad thorn in my side? Um, because those, the negative benefits of upsetting uh, your crew members can really, really hurt. Um, and so, you know, it's this really interesting game of like, 
playing favorites, but maybe not playing so favorite that people start to get angry like they did in that situation, and then you're forced to appease them. It, yeah, again, like, uh, in real life, you know, you can't appease everyone. And, and, and you know, for those who have watched kind of a, a, a Game of Thrones uh, and, 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 uh, <laughs> and uh, um, a House of the Dragon, you know, like, um, Leaders who try to appease everyone tend to appease no one, right? So, yeah. <laughs> and end um, up dead, which I think and, is and end up dead, which is also very fitting. fitting. Yeah, <laughs> uh, um, definitely something. What was that equipment card you just put on? Sorry, I didn't quite see it. Yeah, so every time I kill an enemy, I gain an energy. Right. Now that's really nice with those turrets, right? Because that's gonna like you have to take down the turrets anyway, so you're gonna be getting a little bit of energy recycling. And the great thing is those turrets, especially the seekers too, are such they're relatively lightweight. Like they don't have shields like the lust grunts do, or most of the lust units do for that matter. So you know, it, and you ha you do have some AOE yeah. options available to you. So that's gonna be really helpful like your energy um, by having that equipment card going uh, and then using some of those AOE attacks to your benefit. Exactly. So yeah, this 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 build is definitely a little bit more of a hit and run kind of tactic, um, which is not usually my play style. But that is the hand I am dealt. So, uh, <laughs> this is all about playing the hand you're dealt. Yeah. All right. So I'm just that. you got really lucky there because uh, the one AOE square that wasn't going to take damage was the one right on top of the core, which is closed <laughs> off from you anyway. Uh, so that was basically like a perfect roll on uh, on AOE. Indeed, yeah, yeah. So um, I, I should be shooting two of them. So the first one, and then the second one. Ah, the second one did not hit the core. That was uh, <laughs> too bad. A little bit of a shame, but not not the end of the world. Um, so I am going to move that. Move that I don't need that much of anything. One thing I love that we're kind of seeing here, like we often joke at the office about Hoi Fung speed, um, someone who's playing this game and really like understands it and how quickly they can move and make decisions. I think that's like something really cool to watch because I'm I'm a bit of a slower player uh, and I just like to take my time, but it's really cool to see the way that Earthless can kind of cater towards both different play styles and people who maybe are used to even something like Slay the Spire where you've played 500 hours of it and you're almost not even like reading cards anymore or like, you know, really like, you, kind of have that like object recognition Shit where you just see a thing and area. automatically know what it means without having to like take the time to really think through it. Um, this is definitely a game that that caters to those types of players. Uh, so. Yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, something that we try really hard to do, especially because we have the extra dimension of the grid, is to make sure that everything is snappy. Um, we want to make sure that uh, you're not sacrificing kind of a speed if you will yeah. um for the pro players um but also feel smooth for the kind of like the the, the newcomers and we do definitely think that this is a great kind of an entry level uh um even though it might seem a little bit intimidating i do think it is a quite a good entry level uh, game of this of this nature yeah, I think like I don't want to say too much here, so you know, tell me if I need to shut up. But I think especially that relates to like the story and the way the campaign is structured, right? Like, there's some things in place there um, that you know, if, if this isn't necessarily your cup of tea, if you've never tried a roguelike deck builder before, or maybe you just decided at some point that they weren't they weren't the genre for you, I think Earthless is still worth trying because um, you know we're doing a lot here that it, I think goes beyond what. Um, you know, you normally think of when you say roguelike tech builder, especially with the crew mechanics, and then yeah. this inclusion of the story that we're going to be telling uh, throughout the course of the game, um, I think you know, will really speak to people who, you know, maybe don't care so much for casting cards, but uh, like tactics games, like Fire Emblem and stuff like that. Um, yeah. yeah, like, I, I, you know, as cheesy as it may sound, especially from someone who is in, like, a biased position like me, um, <laughs> do you think that the... Uh, 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 the game as a whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Oh, the lights have gone off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, it is definitely is greater than the uh, sum of its parts. Yeah. And that we try our, we, we really do want to make a cohesive experience that incorporates, you know, things that we love from other genres so that we're not just, 
you know, not not just catering to one audience and, and really trying our best to kind of uh, uh, make sure that everybody will have fun in some area. Yeah, I think this all comes back to this idea, like the, the, the core pillar, the North Star of Earthless being this captain fantasy um, and, and wanting to make an experience. And, you know, we talked to the, at the beginning of the stream about the diegetic UI and making it feel like this immersive experience. You're not just pulling cards up and having them vanish into thin air. You know, you're feeding them into a computer system um, and, and creating this experience that feels very cohesive. Um, that's something we're really proud of. And of course, there's more work to be done there. Um, we're not perfect yet. This is a game that will be in early access. Uh, you did it. <laughs> you survived again. Yeah. I was kind of hoping that we'd see you fail. I want to see. I want to see Hoi Fun. I could. I could. I could have failed in on purpose if you wanted that. <laughs> no. There is a different. There is a different video for that for sure. That's um, great. Yeah. As you can see, like very different play style. Like that one was much more of a hit and run, move around yeah. style. Deck, whereas the other one was like stay in the middle, tank everything. Yeah. A it's lot of it's cool to see that take shape so quickly too, right? Like that, like we said, this is the first star map uh, of three when you're in early access, and then as the game, uh, you know, moves through early access and we add more and more to it, uh, potentially more. So it, it's cool to see so quickly uh, a really unique build start to take shape, and then knowing that eventually when you play the full product um, or even the early access product, that build is going to become even more defined. Uh, and more specialized as you go through. So yeah, that's it. I think, you know, we're at the end of this stream. So I, I think we'll call it here. Hoi fun. Yes. Thank you for joining me on no. uh, our very first dev stream. This Thank was great. Thank you, Steven. You, you should take get some water. You've been talking quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope that's a compliment. I'll take it as a compliment. Uh, it is a compliment. Uh, I'm saying how how um, I'm well a chatty spoken. dude. I can't help yeah, it. Yeah, well spoken, well spoken. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so you know, thank you for if you watched this live stream for the whole thing, or you just jumped in at a certain point. Uh, it means the world to us that you took the time to come and check out Earthless uh, on the Steam page. You know, do us a huge favor and please consider wishlisting Earthless. Uh, as I said a million times already on this stream, it is the best way that you can support us um, and and Hoi Fung and his team, this scrappy uh, team of of twenty. Um, 20, yeah, 21, 22. 20 ish uh, people. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, it, it means the world to us. And by all means, play the demo and then tell us what you think of it. We would love to hear your thoughts. Uh, you can message us at BBI Games on Twitter, or you can message the Earthless account, uh, Earthless Game, which is available on uh, almost all the social platforms. So you'll, you'll be sure to find it on whatever social platform you prefer. Um, and yeah, wishlist the game. I think that kind of covers the gist of it. Please join the Discord community, which uh, the, you'll find the link on any of those pages, or I'm, I'm sure at some point it's probably popped up on one of these screens here. So um, yeah, thank you for taking the time. Thank you for playing Earthless, and uh, we'll see you guys all soon. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.